much for having me here today. Um, I love the theme, the idea of redefining the we in the context of global citizenship. And when this topic was uh, proposed to me, one of the buzzwords that came into my head that's been um, growing in the 21st century is the idea of global connectivity, how we're all linked. And global connectivity, in general, has two purposes. The exchange of information and the creation of wealth. I think we're all pretty much in favor of those things, right? <laughs> now, in order to do these things successfully, we need three different components. We need entrepreneurial, energetic individuals. Hopefully that's you. We need the internet. Got that. And we need the English language. I thought that was kind of an interesting combination, an interesting final piece, that the English language would be in many ways considered a requirement for this. And the fact is that as nations become more interdependent, uh, the English language is becoming one of the most used tools to uh, importing political, economic, academic, and sociocultural ties among people. Former South Korean President Kim Dae-jung once said, we will not win in world competition unless South Korea masters the lingua franca of the internet age. Learn English or face being left behind. The pressure is on. But what role does English really play in different societies? Kashri's model has the various countries around the world as being broken down into three groups based on their use of English. The inner circle is where we are. The inner circle is made up of countries that have a historical and cultural basis in the English language. The outer circle, a little bit small, but the outer circle is made up of primarily countries that have, where English has become institutionalized but as a result of a long history of colonization in one form or other. So we've got countries like Singapore, like Pakistan, India, Philippines, etc. And the outer circle, excuse me, the expanding circle is made up of countries that are choosing to use English or in some ways being strong armed into using English to plan a lot of other levels, be it for economic purposes, for political purposes, for academic purposes, um, but also for socio-cultural purposes. What country doesn't watch Hollywood movies? Everybody seems to know who the Beatles are. Doesn't matter how old you are or what country you're in, they seem to be everywhere. When I was living in Japan, it seemed like there was an unwritten rule that if you did not have at least one English word in an advertising slogan, it could not be used. And it was always the same seven or eight words. It was words like life, uh, love, uh, life, happy, home, heart, dream, beautiful, and let's. And the word let's was always followed by an object, so it was stuff like, let's sports. <laughs> <laughs> to them it made sense. It didn't matter that to us the grammar was a little funky. As long as it had that panache, then it could be approved. Same thing with pop music lyrics all over the place. And we're not going to get into the debate about language hegemony or hegemony as far as the whole colonization issue. I'll leave that drum for somebody else to say. But the fact is that Ultimately, the English language is spreading faster and faster. And so what does that mean for us as potentially native speakers here in the inner circle? It means there's a bit of a power shift going on. Currently, there's somewhere around 400 million native English speakers. How you define native versus non-native, again, that's another drone for somebody else. Comparatively, however, we've got 700 million non-native speakers of one level or other, almost twice as many non-native does native. This has some implications as well. The uh, British Council's report English Next says, where the global importance of languages used to depend on the number and wealth of native speakers, now the number of people who use it as a second language <coughs> is becoming a more significant factor. Interesting. So, Mark Twain once said, the property has gone into the hands of a joint stock company, and we own the bulk of the shares. Now he was referring to English, but the interesting thing was that he was talking about, back in the late 1800s, the fact that the bulk of the shares was no longer being held by the British, but now by the Americans. 
that the British standard was not the only standard that mattered, that the American variety that was emerging and becoming its own independent variety was equally valuable and did not need to be second rate to the British. Ironically, the statement still sort of stands true, except now we, as the Americans, have sort of shifted to the side of the British, and the majority of the shares are being held by everybody else in those outer and expanding circles. Now, people don't tend to like that idea of losing power, losing shares, etc. Don't we have some sort of role, some sort of responsibility as native speakers, so to speak, about identifying good versus bad English, about upholding some kind of standard? Or with this evolution, are we supposed to just sort of lay down and let anything go? Say that everybody's variety is the same, everybody's is fine, we have to accept everything. It depends on the context. Who is using English and for what purposes? It's no longer the case that outer and expanding circle countries are learning to use English or choosing to use English for the sake of communicating with those of us in the inner circles. More and more now, people in the outer and expanding circles are using English to communicate with each other. People in Egypt are more likely to use English when doing business with China than to use Mandarin or to use Arabic, potentially. Not that those languages aren't being used, depending on who's conducting the business at the time, but more likely, English is going to be a common language that finds them. Uh, and at that point, whatever I consider to be the standard of English that I think is the best, that I think is the most formal, is irrelevant. I'm not part of the conversation. Ultimately, what matters is the two goals in communication of intelligibility and clarity. Intelligibility meaning, can you understand the words coming out of my mouth? And clarity, do you understand the meaning that they hold? So we have to consider our objectives. What do I want to get out of this conversation that I'm having? Where am I? Who am I having a conversation with? We also have to consider our mutual responsibility. It doesn't matter if I'm a native speaker, quote unquote, or not. If I'm speaking with anybody else, I have just as much responsibility to make sure that they understand me as to do my best to understand them, regardless of the variety of English that's being used. And as such, we need to be a little flexible on this front. Now, what does flexibility mean? It could mean that I have to adjust the way that I talk in order to be more intelligible, more comprehensible to my audience. So what might this look like in practice? So, we took the realm of, let's take an example, pretty common, the world of the call center. <laughs> probably heard of these things. Probably spoken to someone who works at one. And it's, it was a very good chance it was somewhere in South Asia, Philippines, who knows where. So, everybody's familiar with the issue of having to learn American accents in order to deal with American people, etc. There are those who would argue that this is fake, or this is a pretend accent that they're trying to work on. Well, we could look at it that way. Or we could look at, look at it as a question of skill building. Because the, the reality is that we all speak in a variety of registers and a variety of styles, depending on whom we are speaking to. Because we want to present the message in a way that will help the listener hear the meaning and stop focusing on the medium or the voice. If you don't like this example, let's break it down a lot more. I love playing with my nephews. My nephew Anthony's three years old. We might have a conversation like, he'll tell me what he had for lunch, and I might say, you had pizza for lunch today? Wow, I love pizza. Chances are, when I'm teaching my grad students over at Penn, I'm not going to say to them something like, your article is accepted for the publication in TESOL Quarterly Journal? Wow, I love the TESOL Quarterly Journal. <laughs> Why? It might, but... <laughs> <laughs> Nonetheless, am I faking one? Am I being pretending, pretending to be something else? No, I'm adjusting based on my audience. I'm adjusting my message in a way that the person I'm speaking to will accept the meaning that underlies it. Um, now, this also means that, 
If I go to, when I'm speaking in Spanish, I don't worry so much about trying to prove my Americanness. I just want them to listen, so I do my best to sound as much like a native speaker as I can manage. That's my choice, and choice is always part of it. Depends on what your priorities are. But the fact is, with or without the growth of the various spheres of English, the different circles of English, the language itself, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to mention a point earlier, as the number of users grows, there is a definite implication, and that is that the more people use English, the faster the language will evolve, and in the more different <coughs> ways it will evolve, the more varieties of the language will evolve. And people don't like this. Those of us who want to keep our shares in the stock, that's contentious. And so I would ask you to, in the concept of empathy, sort of step out of the out of their shoes for a moment and consider the fact that with or without them, the English language is evolving anyway. And you are all contributing to it. So, in the interest of uh, being here in school, you being a professor, you guys being students, let's have a pop quiz. I'm going to give you four questions. And I don't want you to overthink it. I want you to go with your gut response. And you're all going to raise your hands as you vote. All the questions are multiple choice, OK? Yes, with me? Hello? Yes? Yes. yes. Thank you. There we go. Love it. All right, question number one. Which of the following is correct? A, if I would have known you were coming, I would have been ready. B, if I had known you were coming, I would have been ready. B, Which is ready? Raise your hand if you think it's A. If you would say A, raise your hand. If you would say B, raise your hand. Correct? <laughs> but it's amazing how many people say A. And I'm not talking about, and by the way, I would be curious to know if you know this is the correct answer or if you use it. Big difference. I hear incredibly highly educated people all over the place using the former. It's become a secondary standard. And no need to answer out loud, just raise your hands. Question number two, which is correct. A, please give your feedback forms to Bob and me before you leave. B, please give your feedback forms to Bob and I before you leave. C, please give your feedback forms to Bob and myself before you leave. If you, think, if you would use A, raise your hand. If you would use B, raise your hand. If you would use C, raise your hand. The answer is A. Now again, we're looking at what has prescriptively, historically been considered to be the correct answer. But more and more, the others are being used. Whether or not they would be by grammatical textbook standards correct is irrelevant. It's becoming so popular that most people that I hear talk actually use B. It doesn't matter in what context it's in. Let's try one more. Which is the correct word? Preventative or preventive? Do you take preventative measures? Or do you take preventive measures? By the way, how many of you are native speakers? Oh, that makes it a more interesting question. <laughs> or claim to be native speakers. So, how many think it's A? How many would use A? How many would use B? According to my Walker's Dictionary of 1824, <laughs> there is historically no such thing as preventative because you don't preventative things. <laughs> preventive. Hence, it's preventive. Last question. What, how would you most likely pronounce this word? <laughs> would you say oops, yeah. nuclear or nuclear? Think about what you say. Would you say nuclear or nuclear? The fact is, the quote correct pronunciation should be nuclear. It's the way it's spelled. But more and more now, people say nuclear. Flip the L and stick in another vowel in the middle there. And we can all thank uh, Florida President George Bush for uh, moving that place. But I also hear it on the news. I hear it in actors. It's written into scripts. It's not corrected. It is becoming a new norm. It is becoming equally accepted. Just like preventative is often put in the dictionary now as an alternative for preventive along with irregardless, which drives me nuts. <laughs> Don't do that. So maybe really the question is not to think so much about who's a native speaker and who's a non-native speaker, but instead to think about why we are using English. Because clearly we're all involved in the evolution of language, little by little. We're all guilty of making a change. 
So when we hear using English for things that have been referred to as, instead of using it as a lingua franca, so to speak, as a lingua economica, when we use English to communicate for business purposes, economic advantage and need, a lingua cultura, <coughs> Uh, specific values and norms of a society or a class, community, etc. A lingua academica, the use of English for academic games, studying abroad, etc. Or even a lingua emotiva, one in Hollywood, global advertising, public relations, etc. And for a lot of other reasons as well. But ultimately, they come together and as forming communities of practice, practitioners who use this language as a tie, as a tool to bring us together for these purposes, this creates an instance of me. Personally, I realize that I am lucky that so many people around the world are willing to learn English as a second, third, fifth, ninth language and accommodate me. Because Really, that's a very humbling prospect. If I had learned all of those languages, I would be doing business with a lot fewer people. But the fact is, they have all made that effort to connect with me, to make a we through English. And I have to be humbled in recognizing that. They're not relying on my abilities to meet them at the halfway point even. I was very glad when I was in Egypt last summer that everybody ranging from the vendor at the bazaar to the uh, doctor at the hospital, we're all speaking English. That's really something for me to be grateful for, for me to be humbled by. All part of that community. So in the end, do we choose to continue to use English as a tool of division, separating or maintaining the separation between us and them, inner versus outer and expanding circle, native versus non-native speakers, or do we choose to use English and view English in all of its variations as a tool for unification, as a tool that forges a new we through communities of practice, with the goals of mutual gains through mutual respect and common goals? In the end, the choice is yours. Thank you.